Okay, so this will be lecture 11, Gaussian integers applied. Uh, this is to make up for the snow day. Uh, basically, I'm hoping to finish chapter 6 here as quickly as I can. I'm going to use a slightly different format than I've tried before. We'll see how this goes. Um, so, first of all, I'm going to talk about the division algorithm in the Gaussian integers. Um, we saw some examples of this in lecture 10, but I'm just going to state it again and prove it real quick here. So let z be a Gaussian integer, let w be a Gaussian integer. Then there exists a quotient and remainder also Gaussian integers, such that z is equal to qw plus the remainder, um, such that the norm of r is less than the norm of w, w being the dividing number, r being the remainder. So I'm going to follow a proof I found in, in Schifrin's, um advanced, uh, let's see, I think it's advanced algebra. Uh, is it abstract algebra geometric approach, I think is the name of it. Let's see, I've got that down here. All right, so here it is. Pan down a little bit here. I'm still getting used to this, guys. So here we go. Consider the complex number z over w. Okay, so that would be a plus bi over c plus di. Um, well, that's going to give you some x and y, which are rational numbers. And then plus i, of course, that makes it the rational numbers that join i. Okay, so then you can choose integers m and n such that you're within a half a unit um, of x and within a half a unit of y for both, uh, you know, these m and n. That's it's fairly obvious geometrically that you can do that if you just think about the integer lattice. There should always be something closest. We actually looked at examples of that last time. Okay, with those choices, though, if I set q equal to m plus ni and the remainder, basically by construction z minus qw, then what would we want? We want to show that the remainder, the norm of the remainder is less than the norm of the dividing number. Okay, fine. Um, well, notice this list of equivalencies here, right? Let's pan down a little bit. All right. Um, so if the norm, uh, norm of r squared less than, well, excuse me, norm of r less than norm of w, that's equivalent to saying the norm of r over w is less than 1, because we know w is not 0 here. Um, but that's the same as saying that the norm of z over w minus q is less than 1, because remember that this r was defined right here to be z minus qw, so the, the w's cancel on the q and just leaves you that. Okay, so that's one thing. Put that, put that, uh, store that for future use here. However, let me just pan down to the bottom here so we can look at this without me thinking about panning. Okay, there's the end of the road. Um, however, by construction of m and n and r, you can see that the, 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 the distance between z over w and q, well, that's equal to, you know, x plus yi, because that's z over w, minus m plus ni, because, well, that was q. And by definition, that's the square root of x minus m squared plus y minus n squared, right? But if you look at this triangle, right, this is the relation between m and n, like, um, this is the worst case scenario, if would be if, if x plus i y was actually one half unit away from x plus i n. And if um, m plus i y was actually a half a unit from m plus i y, that'd be the worst. In that case, even that worst case scenario, you only have a square root of 2 over 2 distance between this guy and that guy, which is how I get that this inequality is less than square root 2 over 2. Aha, well that's exactly, that's all I need though, because then that shows that the distance between z over w and q is less than root 2 over 2, which is less than 1, and therefore the, uh, the norm of the remainder is less than the norm of the dividing number as I wanted, and there you go, division algorithm in the Gaussian integers. So that's pretty nice, I thought it would be nice to show you guys maybe another example. Um, let's see here if I can can do this. <clears throat> of course I'll try to scan these things as soon as I get a chance, maybe tomorrow. All right, so I think that should that should work. Let me pan back up here. Whoop. Up we go. Close your eyes if you're motion sick. All right, let me tighten it here for a second. Okay, so suppose so you have z equals minus 4 plus 2i, you got w equals 3 plus 2i. I also stole this example from Schifrin's uh, 
that movie is Scherfer, and I'm not sure how to say his name. My apologies. He's a very good mathematician. I enjoy his work on the stack exchange. Anyway, so z over w um, would be this, right? Minus 4 over 2i. You rationalize the thing, multiply by the conjugate of the denominator over that, you know. And out pops minus 8 plus 14i. Okay, well, 8 over 13 is close to minus 1. Minus 8 over 13 is close to minus 1. And this other, the 14 over 13, well, that's close to that's close to i, right? So a reasonable quotient um, would be minus 1 plus i. And then you can calculate then that the remainder is, of course, z minus q times w, which here ends up giving you 1 plus i. So there you go. Um, z minus 4 plus 2i is equal to w, 3 plus 2i, the dividing number times the quotient, plus the remainder. And you can easily check that the norm of the remainder is less than the norm of the dividing number. Okay, that's a, one example. There we go. Try to go fairly fast for these. We got a lot to cover here. I don't want to make you listen to me talk too much. You can always pause and think about it some more. Okay, example two. Let's calculate the greatest common divisor of one minus five i and z uh, seven plus four i. So start with I'll put the seven plus four i um, basically on top, and the one minus four i, one minus five i on the bottom. Use your usual thing. Rationalize. That gives me this complex number. Oops, forgetting to use that pencil. Where my pencil go? gives me this complex number, and then, um, so obviously, that's right in the middle of four possible quotients, right? So, um, all things else, others being considered, you know, the same, I mean, well, choose the easy one, right? Choose I. Anyway, you see the choice of quotient is certainly not unique, especially in this one. Um, anyway, Q equals I for simplicity, and then out pops the remainder of 2 plus 3I, a short calculation. You can see that I times 1 minus 5I gives you I plus 5, but you got 7, so you need 2, and you've got, uh, let's see here, plus i. You had 4i, that means you had to have 3i to get back to the 4i. I can kind of just work this one out in my head. All right, so then, starting the Euclidean algorithm, I've got 7 plus 4i, minus five, um, 1 minus 5i is my zw. Put my w down here, and then to get the second remainder, I take, what do I do? I take z minus i times the dividing number w. All right. It turns out that's it, because the um, this 2 plus 3i is actually a divisor of that, um, which you can see from here. If I take 1 minus 5i divided by 2 plus 3i, I end up with minus 1 minus i, which shows that uh, 2 plus 3i actually divides 1 minus 5i. So, okay, I've got a summary of this on my next sheet. Let me skip ahead to there. <clears throat> you guys can forgive me for not writing here. It took me a while to come up with these notes. All right, so pan back up again. Oh no, so shaky. I guess I should have spent more than thirty dollars for a tripod. Oh well. He he he. All right, stay stay put. All right, there we go. So again, this is the same example we were just talking about. I just found that 1 minus 5i is equal to 1 minus 1 minus i, oops, I forgot my pencil, um, times 2 plus 3i, which again shows that 2 plus 3i divides 1 minus 5i. And that means that the Euclidean, uh, Euclidean algorithm is going to halt there, right? Once we get one, uh, once we get a, um, a even multiple of the last remainder uh, that we stop, and that shows that the greatest common divisor actually is 2 plus 3i. And there you go, there's even how to attain it as a, um, a, a combination, a linear combination of Gaussian integers. There you go, 7 plus 4i minus i times 1 minus 5i is equal to 2 plus 3i. So that's sort of the Gaussian integer um, analog of Bizzou's identity. Then, um, okay, so basically retracing the steps of how did we get to those lovely theorems we have about um, unique, you know, um, the, the, the prime divisor property and the unique prime factorization. So I'm just going to just very quickly trace back through the logic there. First of all, the proof of the Euclidean algorithm in the Gaussian integers really would be much the same as the proof of the Euclidean algorithm in the integers. Essentially, you just, it basically amounts to being able to use the division algorithm. And so if you look at the, the, the arguments we gave back in lecture two, 
or section 3 of my modular arithmetic PDF, those arguments almost straightforwardly transfer over to the Gaussian integers. I'm not going to get into all that. Let's talk a little bit about Bazal's identity, though. So if you have Z and W in the Gaussian integers, not both zero. Okay, then there exists M and N in the Gaussian integers such that ZM plus WN is equal to the greatest common divisor of, of, uh, of Z and W, right? So, pan down here. I think we can stop right there for the moment. Okay. Um, so the way to prove Bazal's identity for the Gaussian integers is the same as we did um, in the integers. Basically, the, the proof was to calculate the greatest common divisor by Euclid's algorithm. And then you just rearrange terms. Basically, some people would do back substitution. We had this, um, you know, this vector. We, we, we write the A comma B and kind of follow it down. And that just, that shows us the linear combination um, of the original pair which forms the greatest common divisor and so it's, it's essentially the example I just showed you shows you the proof in a specific case it's kind of the same in general though in other words I'm saying prove it the same way as you did in Z um, the the prime divisor property again I'm going to go through the proof but I would just tell you it's pretty much the same as we saw before so if, if, if a Gaussian prime um, pi well, this is a Apparently a funny way of writing pi, as yeah, Stowell says. I'll, I'm going I'm to call that omega bar. I'm going to call it. Uh, I'm going to call it omega bar. I don't feel like calling it pi. Fine, uh, I give up. Okay, so suppose omega bar divides alpha beta, then you either have uh, omega bar divides alpha, or omega bar divides beta. So basically, a Gaussian prime can't disappear. It's got to either be in here or it's got to be in there. It can't can't not be in either of them. It's, they're kind of indestructible. They're atomic in some sense, although I think that terminology is physically dated. <laughs> anyway, um, suppose omega bar divides alpha beta for some alpha and beta and zi, where omega bar is a Gaussian prime. If omega bar does not divide alpha, then it remains to show that omega, divide, omega bar divides beta. Okay, but Bazal's identity says that you can find m and n in the Gaussian integer such that alpha m plus omega bar n is equal to the greatest common divisor of alpha and omega bar. But I can multiply this by beta and attain this identity. Alpha beta m plus omega bar beta n equals beta times the greatest common divisor of alpha and w bar, I mean omega bar. Okay, but we also know that omega bar divides alpha beta, right? That means there exists a gamma, a Gaussian integer, such that the product of alpha and beta is equal to gamma times omega bar. So I can plug that in to my alpha beta and replace my alpha beta with a, with a gamma omega bar, and then that's really nice because I've got omega bar in both of these terms. So what we find then is that the greatest common divisor of alpha and omega bar times beta is equal to this particular Gaussian integer, m gamma plus n beta, who cares what it is, it's a Gaussian integer, times omega bar. Okay, but then, aha, behold, your problem 85, the mysterious problem 85 that was missing until just this very moment. You can show, problem 85, that the greatest common divisor of alpha and omega bar is either plus or minus 1 or plus or minus i. It's got to be one of the units of the Gaussian primes. So given the, what are we assuming here for problem 85? We're assuming that um, omega bar is a Gaussian prime. And what else are we assuming here? Omega bar is Gaussian prime. And alpha is what? Well, omega bar divides alpha beta. I'm not entirely sure you even need that, but there's got to be a way to prove this. Um, in the previous proof for the um, for the integers, at this point in the proof, we just had that the greatest common divisor was one, because we were we we're looking at a prime, I think, and a prime and any other number. Well, the greatest common divisor is one, so this is the analog of that for this problem. That's what I've left to you guys for problem 85. Very exciting. Yes, no. Well, anyway, any questions about it? <laughs> That's right. Anyway, sorry. Um, uh, oh, okay, so anyway, anyway, so getting back to the point. So we have plus or minus 1 times plus or minus i times this thing. Um, beta is equal to this. And, I mean, whatever it is, either plus or minus 1 or plus or minus i, you can 
um, basically divide by that or multiply it. It's its own inverse and or up to a minus sign or something. Anyway, the point is you can solve for beta for any of those four units. And once you do that, it's clear that um, beta divides, uh, oh, excuse me, that omega bar divides beta, which is what we set out to prove. Uh, prove. So there you go. There's your prime divisor property, still true in the Gaussian integers. Stillwell doesn't have quite this much detail. I thought it would be helpful for you guys to see it a little bit. Unique prime factorization. Um, let's see here. We're on page what? So essentially, here it is, down at the bottom. Er, I forgot which way it's in Titans. Righty loosey, lefty tighty. Wait a minute. That's wrong. Anyway, unique prime factorization. The Gaussian integer can be written as a product of Gaussian primes um, for some unique set of Gaussian primes. I mean, they could be repeated, but there's some set of them that you can multiply together and get back to Gaussian integer up to reordering and perhaps some units. The proof of the unique prime factorization is essentially the same as the proof we gave in the integers back in page 6 of lecture 2. You can look at it if you want. Or not. <clears throat> anyway, rest assured, there is in fact a unique prime factorization property for the Gaussian integers. Mm -hmm. All right, so I've said a little bit more about how proofs in the integers lift to proofs in the Gaussian integers than Stowell does. I hope you can see that he's really pretty much justified in this omission as it doesn't really add much to our calculational prowess. And if we could just trust him, it was actually true. Okay. But I guess, you know, trust probably isn't... I mean, we should check these sorts of things. We're going to be good, good math students. All right, here we are. So, in section 3, um, section 6.3 rather, we saw that a prime p which was real was not of the form a squared plus b squared. Um, and also, if it was pure imaginary, that basically means it's not of the form i times a squared plus b squared. So, if you had p equals a squared plus b squared, and it was an ordinary prime in C, then you could factor over the Gaussian integers, right, to A plus IB, A minus IB. Both of these have norm P, which means that they themselves, the, the, the factors here, are actually Gaussian primes. Um, and now we continue that story. So here's the theorem. Gaussian primes, A, a Gaussian prime, A plus IB, with A and B non-zero, give P equals to A squared plus B squared an ordinary prime in the integers. Okay, so the proof has given me some fits, but it's actually not that complicated. So let me just pan down a little bit here and talk you through it. Let's see here, just pan up just a bit, all right. So we argued in lecture 10 that A plus IB was a Gaussian prime implies that A minus IB is also a Gaussian prime. Great. Um, furthermore, you might notice that the product of A plus IB and its conjugate gives you A squared plus B squared. So let's set P, we're, we're assuming what? We're assuming um, that A plus IB is a Gaussian prime. Okay, guys. Um, so with that said, um, we've got, we also get for free the conjugate Gaussian prime, and we can set P equal to A squared plus B squared. And we know that P is going to be an element of the natural numbers. Okay, so suppose that P actually could factor into R and S. All right. Then what that would say is that a plus ib times a minus ib was equal to r times s, which was equal to p, all right? But here's the thing. p already has the factorization omega 1 bar and omega bar 2 equals a plus ib and a minus ib. Those are both Gaussian primes. We just got done saying that the Gaussian, uh, you know, the, the, there was a unique factorization in the Gaussian integers, right? So what's the deal? Um, omega bar 1 and omega bar 2 do not match rs factorization, which, if you think about it, would either be a pair of, of real Gaussian primes, right? So they, you know, that would be it. Or they themselves can split in the Gaussians to like this and that. In either case, you either have a, a pair of two Gaussian primes which don't match the given Gaussian primes, right? Because these are inherently complex. And if, and if R and S were Gaussian primes, real Gaussian primes, so then, well, real Gaussian primes don't match complex Gaussian primes. That's one case. It doesn't match up. 
or in the case that R and S actually aren't Gaussian primes, that they, in the case that they split into Gaussian primes, then you're still in trouble because then you got four Gaussian factors which can't hope to match these two which we're already given. So by the unique prime factorization, there can't be such an R and S, which means, going back up to the top, what that means then, let me pan down a bit here, what that means then, of course, is that such an R and S don't exist, and P is in fact prime. Moreover, if you think about it, the prime is equal to the, the absolute value of A squared plus the absolute value of B squared for the unique pair, absolute value of A, absolute value of B in the natural numbers. Um, so once you're given that A plus I B is a, is a Gaussian prime, if you just take the absolute value of A and the absolute value of B, that uniquely picks out a prime, absolute value of A squared plus absolute value of B squared. Um, by the way, this is an improvement of my original page 10 in lecture 10, which I think was, um, well, substandard to this. All right, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Moving on to uh, page five here. Again, I'm trying to move pretty fast here. Mostly, guys, I'm just covering what's in, what's in Stillwell. So if you've read chapter six, this should be a snooze for you. Um, if you haven't, I don't know, maybe it helps. Well, maybe even if you have, it helps. I think I personally have to read this chapter a few times before it really sunk into my thick skull. But you guys are smarter. So whatever. All right, let's see here. That ought to do it. Okay, so to, to recap and to look forward. Primes, <coughs> excuse me. Primes of the form 4z plus 3 are not of the form a squared plus p squared. We, we've seen that previously. That's easy enough to check just by looking at the, um, you know, the quadratic form x squared plus y squared and evaluating on the uh, four congruence classes mod 4. None of them give you back the, the 3 class when you plug them in. Um, for Mod's 2 square theorem, what does it say? It says that the remaining odd primes of the form 4z plus 1 are in fact sums of squares. This is Fermat's famed two-square theorem, which we're about to set out to prove. So here's an outline. Basically, we're going to factor 4n plus 1 with the help of a particular integer, um, for which p is equal to m squared plus 1, and then once we have that, then we know m squared plus 1 can be factored in m plus i times m minus i, and then magic happens. Okay, let me not get ahead of the story too much. The critical piece of technology in all of this is Lagrange's lemma. I should caution you, don't try to prove this without Lagrange's lemma. Um, Fermat said that he proved this by something called descent. And so, I mean, the, the two-square theorem, he proved it by descent. Basically, his proof was something along the lines of, hey, if there's, um, if there's one prime not of the, f if there's one prime 4n plus 1, which is not of the form a squared plus b squared, then there are infinitely more smaller primes also of the form a squared, not, a, not, a squared, not equal to a squared plus b squared which is, an, of course, an absurdity. Now, Fermat did not write down that proof. Um, later, Stowell mentions at the end of the chapter that Euler actually spent several years proving this result. Um, so, yeah, trying to prove this without Lagrange's lemma probably a bad idea. On the other hand, we'll prove it in about 15 minutes. So let's go on. Lagrange's lemma. A prime p equals 4n plus 1 divides m squared plus 1. For, oh, I forgot to use my pencil. Divides m squared plus 1 for some m. Um, in the integers. So finally we get to use Wilson's theorem. I know you didn't get to use it on the test, but look, it's come back. So I don't feel bad. That studying wasn't for something, for nothing, rather, you, you're using it now. Um, apply Wilson's theorem to the prime p equals 4n plus 1. So basically here we go. Minus 1 is congruent to what? Um, 1 times 2 times 3 da -da 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 times 4n. Okay, because we're looking mod um, mod p and so Wilson's theorem said what it said that uh, um, what, what did it say minus one was congruent to what p minus one right so this is p minus one mod p of course and then so what you do is you play a game you split off one the, the product one to two n and then of course you got two n plus one all the way out to four n nothing happened here I'm just writing it out this step next step funny business let's see here so what do we do um, keep these guys the same, but then I trade 2n plus 1 for minus 2n. Now I can do that because I'm working mod 4n plus 1. So right, if I subtract 4n plus 1 from this, I get minus 2n. 
and I continue this game until I get minus one down here, right? So if you look at this, I've got how many factors? I've got two n copies of minus one. So that pulls out a minus one to the two n, which of course is a harmless number one. And on the other hand, I got this guy squared. Well, voila. So that gives me two n factorial squared mod p, which is precisely what we set out to prove, which was that, um, you know, well, let's see here. So that, that's, that's the m, right? Set m equal to 2n factorial, the, and then that gives us the m squared is congruent to minus 1 mod p. Or another way to look at it would be that p divides m squared plus 1. This turns out to be the first chapter in something much deeper, which we eventually spend a lot of time on in chapter 9, something called the, uh, what is it called, the uh, quadratic... Oh, I forgot the name of the stupid thing. Well, we'll get back to it a little bit later. Anyway, there's Lagrange's lemma. Let me move on. Hope you're not too annoyed I'm not writing at the moment. It's the, in the best interest of all involved today. Okay, so here we are. Um, page 6 of my lecture. 11. Come on. Ah, oh. Behave. Stupid camera. Stop doing that. If I understood anything about torque, uh, I guess I need to do this. Alright, anyway, so here we go. So here we go. Fermat's two square theorem. The main event. So, let n be a natural number as usual. If p is equal to 4n plus 1 a prime, then that prime is the sum of a squared plus b squared for some a and b. So here it goes. If p is equal to 4n plus 1 is prime, then Lagrange's lemma says that there exists a uh, an integer m such that p divides m squared plus 1. But that means that p divides m plus i times m minus i in the Gaussian integers. So observe that if... It, now, so I'm working towards a contradiction here now. Observe, if p, if p divides m plus or minus i, either one, that would mean that there exists some Gaussian integer q such that m plus or minus i was equal to pq, right? Okay, but if you divide by p, then that gives you that m plus or minus i over p is equal to q. Now, that's kind of weird because q is supposed to be a Gaussian integer, but what's on the left-hand side here pretty clearly isn't because, like, for example, just focus on the 1 over p that's a coefficient of i. Well, 1 over p is not an integer, because p is prime, which means it's not 1. It's, you know, whatever, 3, 5, 7. Oh, I better choose the right kind of primes. It's one of these guys. But anyway, it's like, uh, oh, math, 5, um, what's another one, 13, 17, so forth. Um, anyway, so the point is that p um, cannot divide m plus or minus i. I can't divide m plus i. p cannot divide m minus i. Why? Because that would say that the, the q here was not a Gaussian integer, which is a contradiction to saying that it, that it, uh, that it divides it. Um, so therefore, p does not divide either of these factors. So what this shows, then, is that um, p divides this product, m plus i and m minus i, and yet p does not divide either one of the factors making up the product. In other words, p does not satisfy the Gaussian prime divisor property. So that means that p is not a Gaussian prime. Therefore, p must be an ordinary prime of the form a squared plus b squared by section 6.3 theorem, right? Section 6.3 in lecture 10, we proved that a real Gaussian prime is an ordinary prime. Um, and that means that p is, is, is uh, not equal to a squared. A Gaussian prime is, is, is a prime where it's not equal to a squared plus b squared. Um, okay, anyway. <clears throat> Catch my breath here. So, <clears throat> that brings us back. This is a pretty big deal, this theorem is really... Like I said, this theorem took Euler several years to prove. That's, um, it's really kind of amazing how simple it was for us to disprove it. 
Uh, it's really kind of staggering, actually. That just shows you how deep the insight of working with Gaussian integers is. It's really, really insightful to work with Gaussian integers. Okay, so the Pythagorean triples, we talked about the start of, class, the, start of the course, first lecture, right? x squared plus y squared equals z squared, looking for integer solutions. Um, and at the very end of our discussion, I, we just sort of glibly used the Gaussian integers, and um, we made some claims that we didn't, weren't were justified at that time. It turns out that with some slight modifications, they were actually reasonable. So let me just talk us through it. First of all, we need to make some observation about squares of odd and even number. First of all, the square of an odd number is congruent to 1 mod 4. The square of an even number is congruent to 0 mod 4. Okay. I think most of you guys would have liked this for test questions <laughs> last time around. Who knows, maybe it's a question on the final. Um, also, if you consider the sum of two odd squares, right, 2j plus 1 squared, 2k, 2k plus 1 squared, multiply it out, group things together that have 4s, you can see that it's congruent to 2 mod 4. But you see 2, of course, sorry, 2 is neither 1 nor 0, which goes to show you that the sum of odd squares is in fact not itself a square. Okay, so then what? So, if we're interested in these solutions x, y, z to x squared plus y squared equals z squared, which do not have a common factor, except for plus or minus 1 perhaps, those are called primitive solutions, or a primitive triple. Um, and since either x, y, and z, they're either even or odd numbers, right? Those are, those are your choices. If you look at it, it has to have the pattern even squared plus odd squared equals odd squared, otherwise you can't match up the congruence classes up here, right? So like I'm 0 plus 1 equals 1. I, I, can't, I can't have 0 plus 0 equals... Well, I guess I could have 0 plus 0 equals 0. But I'm something keeping me from doing that. Huh. Huh. Oh, no. Oh, there would be a common factor then of 2, which is forbidden. Okay, so that's what's forbidding that. So since there's no common factor, we can't have two as a common factor, so they can't all be even, so one of them has to be odd. Great. Right. Anyway, so um, basically our argument from section 1.8 back in the first lecture was that if we look at x squared plus y squared equals z squared, and we allow ourselves this sneaky, sneaky trick of saying x plus i y times x minus i y equals z squared, well, that suggests certain things, right? We conjectured... Oops, sorry, I'm talking off-screen. You can forgive me. So again, just to rerun re here a little bit. Primitive triple, um, no common factor. Again, the um, they have to come like even squared plus odd squared equals odd squared. That's what we're looking at, just from looking at the uh, you know, congruent to 1 or congruent to 0 mod 4. We can see that. It has to be the structure for the solutions, the, non, the, the primitive solutions. So we conjectured that um, because of this formula, first of all, if, if x and y, it seemed reasonable to say if x and y were relatively prime, then x plus i y and x minus i y are likewise relatively prime in the Gaussian integer. So that was just a wild, you know, seemed reasonable, but we haven't really, we had no basis to prove that at that point in chapter one. And two, we said that, hey, in zi, the relatively prime factors of a square ought to be squares. In other words, if these guys are relatively prime, if that's a square, it ought to mean that both of these are also squares. That turns out to be almost true. <clears throat> Almost true. Almost true. So here we are. Let me pan back up. Here we go. Okay, so again, our conjectures, relatively prime integers, ought to have um, complex combinations, x plus i, y, x minus i, y, which are relatively prime um, in the Gaussian integers, and then, again, prime factors, relatively prime factors of a square are squares. To see one is correct, we make the following um, argument. 
so here it is. Um, if the greatest common divisor of x and y is 1, then the greatest common divisor of x and y is still 1 in the uh, Gaussian integers for x and y. So that, that proposition, once you have that, it's easy to prove 1. Um, so here it is. Since x and y are in the integers, any common divisor, um, alpha, um, in the Gaussian integers must also allow the conjugate um, to be as a common divisor because x and y are real. In particular, you know, if alpha divides x and alpha divides y, that means that alpha conjugate divides x and alpha conjugate divides y. They make a decent test question, actually. It's not too hard to prove. I'm going to move on. Thus, alpha and the product of alpha and alpha bar and the product of alpha and alpha bar they divide x and y using our divisibility properties, which, by the way, transfer over to the Gaussian integers because it was it was simple algebra which proved those. If you think about it, they're still true in the Gaussian integers, even though I have not proved that. All right, so, but on the other hand, the product of alpha and alpha bar is some natural number um, greater than or equal to 2. Um, so, if you do some algebra here, you can see 2x is equal to sum of x plus i, y and its conjugate, and 2yi is the difference of x plus i, y and its conjugate. And um, thus, a common divider, um, you know, if there's a common divisor alpha in the Gaussian integers of x plus i, y and x minus i, y, well then, that, that same common divisor must, you know, it must also come and be a common divisor of, of linear combinations of those, which means that it must also be a common divisor of 2yi and 2x, all right? But the thing is that the greatest common divisor of x and y is 1, which means that any common prime, you know, any common Gaussian prime divisor of alpha, it's got to be, it's got to be a Gaussian prime, like uh, ordinary primes aren't going to cut it. So your choices are um, plus or minus 1 and plus or minus i. Those, those are the divisors of 2 in the Gaussian integers, all right? Um, again, the ordinary real Gaussian prime case disallowed by the fact that x and y are the integers, share no common, share no prime factors in the integers. Okay, so getting back to the point. However, if there exists alpha plus or minus 1 plus minus a divisor of x plus i, y, and x minus i, y, then what does that mean? That means the product of x plus i, y and its conjugate is equal to this times that, but that's equal to 2 times gamma gamma bar, which means that x squared plus y squared is even but as we discussed for general reasons, is impossible. Consequently, what? Consequently, that meant that there was no alpha. <laughs> so alpha is, at the start of it all, there, there actually is no um, common divisor except for a unit um, of x and y. No common divisor of x and y. <coughs> Excuse me in the Gaussian integers. So actually it turns out that um, 2 on the other hand needs a little bit of modification, not too much. Let me go on with it here. I don't want to talk too long. I'm starting to cough. I'm almost out of papers. I'll talk faster. Sorry to blather on like this. Alright, so where are we? Um, let's see here. Yeah, I'm at the top. So again, x plus i, y, and x minus i, y have no common Gaussian prime factor. However, considering x squared plus y squared equals z squared, you can see that each prime factor of z occurs in an even power, because it's a square, right? So when you look at this product of squares equal to this, it must be that some of the squares fit into x plus i, y, and other squares fit into x minus i, y. However, you also could have units packaged in there. Like you have like i times minus i, you could have, you know, any of the, the units could be could be hidden in there. Um, I mean, there's, there's, there's also a unit in front of, well, I mean, I guess you could have a unit squared over here, but um, I don't, there, there can just be units floating about. So these are basically the cases. Um, x plus i, y are products of squares of Gaussian primes, possibly, and possibly one of either 1, minus 1, i, or minus i. So if you look at that, that means you got these four cases. Um, sorry, let me scroll down a bit here. 
you have these four cases to think about. We just thought about one of these cases back in chapter one, which was not too bad because we actually discovered Euclid's parametric formulas anyway in the in the primitive case. So you either have the unit being one, the unit being minus one, the unit being i, or the unit being minus i. And then s minus ti, s minus ti, s minus ti, s minus ti squared. So you square these things out and multiply it out. You either get s squared minus t squared or t squared minus s squared, either in the real part or the imaginary part. And then in the imaginary part, you either get 2st or minus 2st, and the same thing in the real. So you got these two different parametric formulas for the real and imaginary part. In either case, in all the cases, either x or y is u squared minus v squared, and the other one's 2uv. Because, of course, we can, we can trade a u for a minus u and a v for a minus v, and it doesn't really change the values that this thing cycles through. So this answer is better than what we had in chapter one because it doesn't make doesn't doesn't uh, favor x or y differently. It actually gives us a symmetric treatment of both x and y, which is which is more reflective of the symmetry which is present between x and y. I mean, you can't tell the difference between x and y in this equation if you just look at it, right? Finally, this brings us to a comment. Woo! So the comment is this: the primes, which are sums of squares, are those which appear as hypotenuses of right angled triangles with integer sides, which you can pretty much see from this equation right here if you ponder it. I won't ponder it that long today. Where's my next page? Oh, my pages are getting out of order. All right. <clears throat> All right, so let's go on to page 10 here. All right, so section 6.7, primes of the form 4n plus 1. So here's the theorem. Quadratic character of minus 1. That was the thing I couldn't think to say earlier, earlier in, this, in this talk. Um, the, congruence x, x, the congruence x squared congruent to minus 1 mod p, where p is not prime, has the solution precisely when the prime is of the form 4n plus 1. That's it. I mean, there's... If the prime does not equal 4n plus 1, this thing has no solutions. That's, that's the result. That's the quadratic character of minus 1. Okay. Um, in other words, there's, a, there's a, a square which gives you back minus 1 mod p only when that p is equal to 4n plus 1. So the, the proof is basically by Lagrange's lemma. Lagrange's lemma gives us that x squared is congruent to minus 1 mod p. And then what we do... Um, is we just look at x squared. Okay, so x squared is congruent to minus 1. Suppose uh, the other case, right? The other case that we need to roll. So first of all, um, I mean, the affirmative is given to us by Lagrange's lemma, right? x squared is congruent to minus 1 mod p. We used m instead of x before, but there you go. So that's the affirmative case, right? So the precisely when is what I'm worrying about now. Why is it that it's only 4n plus 1? So, so what's the other case? 4n plus 3. Suppose x squared is congruent to minus 1 mod 4n plus 3. Then what you do is you take both sides to the 2n plus 1 power. The reason we're going to do that is simply so that we can apply Fermat's little theorem. See, Fermat's little theorem says that x to the 4n plus 2, which would be x to the p minus 1, is congruent to 1 mod p. But, hey, on the other hand, we had minus 1 to an odd power, which was minus 1. So we got 1 is congruent to minus 1. Oh, game over. Can't have it. So, this is a pretty, not, not too hard, uh, I mean, I, there were harder things for me to understand in this chapter than this, I'll just say that, okay. Um, so there it is, um, x squared congruent to minus 1 mod p only when p is a prime of the form 4n plus 1. So Stowell says, another way you could look at this is that the odd primes of p which divide values of x squared plus 1 for x and z are precisely those primes of the form uh, 4n plus 1. I should mention, um, I plan to give you as a handout from that um, Abstract Algebra Geometric Approach book. It's got a little bit more than you need, but I think you, those of you, especially those of you who are in 422, will really 
really enjoy it. Or for those of you who will take 422 later at some point in your in your existence, you should keep a copy of it around. You'll see the wisdom of it later. So that teaser for 422 done. Here we go. The other axe we have to grind here is the infinitude infinitude of primes of four, of of the form 4n plus one. It's pretty typical infinite. Uh, proof. Basically, he assumes that there are finitely many, alright? And then he shows that you get a contradiction. So the contradiction, I don't want to talk through all of this, you guys can read it just the same as I could. This is just what Stillwell wrote. Um, just I'll give you the highlights, basically. Um, if there were finitely many primes of that form, he can construct this function, g of y, uh, and that function, g of y, does not have um, any of these finite number of primes, p1 through pk, as divisors for any for any y in the integers, um, which then means that it has to be equal to plus or minus one because those are the only values it could take. Otherwise, it would hit one of the primes. But then that basically means you got these two quadratic equations, either equal to one or equal to minus one. But hey, they're quadratic equations, so they have at most two solutions and. Obviously, you can't take at most two solutions and get tons of integer solutions, which is, you know, a contradiction. Okay, so anyway, basically then, it follows that there exist infinitely many primes of the form a squared plus b squared. Um, there exist infinitely many, in turn, non-real, non-pure imaginary Gaussian primes, stemming from the fact that a squared plus b squared factors into a plus ib times a minus ib, as we have exploited with a vengeance in this lecture. Finally, I'll just say a word or two about the, the conclusion here. Sometimes I forget to say stuff about the conclusion to the chapter in Stillwell, and that's a, that's a shame, because this is really where he knocks it out of the park in this book, in my opinion. These, these discussions at the end of chapters, you know, they really, they're, they, they link what we're doing to what we're about to do, and they're just, they're fantastic. So let me just spend three or four minutes talking about this, and then I'll shut up for today, I think. Or at least for a while. So, basically, to recap, our proof for Fermat's two-square theorem is actually due to Dedekind from around 1894. Um, the original proof was claimed by Fermat to, for, by Fermat to be by descent, um, but it was only eventually written down by Euler, like I told you, after several years of effort. Then Lagrange's lemma came from, well, Lagrange, in about 1773, um, trying to simplify the proof. He still had some complicated stuff, which Gauss cleaned up a bit. And then finally, a little bit later, did a kind of used everything that we've used to put together, made it really simple. Um, so there's been kind of a refining of this two-square theorem, you know, in successive levels of, of getting it easier and easier and easier. Um, that's why I think, as, at least me, as a student, when I saw abstract algebra, I kind of had this impression, oh, abstract algebra is easy. Well, yeah, it's easy if you see the finished product. <laughs> it's the... Um, you know, how they make the sausages, that's the ugly part. Um, let's see here. So, um, <clears throat> anyway, you should remember we're looking at the finished product and, and the difficulty is, is hidden in the fact that the, the difficulty's already been had. What we have is, is the pretty end product of that. Minkowski's Geometry of Numbers is something interesting I haven't had a chance to read much on yet. I probably should. Anyway. The four-square identity is, oh, it's just very, very cool. We're going to see, we're going to spend about a, a week, well, maybe a day or almost, I don't know how long. Anyway, we're going to spend a little while on quaternions. That will give us the four-square identity. Then the proof of the two-square identity, as we've seen from the Gaussian integers, it really was very nice. The proof of the four-square identity is going to come from the quaternionic integers, uh, which is kind of the natural analog to the Gaussian integers there. And... But the other direction that we'll generalize this chapter is instead of looking at x squared plus y squared, we could also look at x squared plus 2y squared or x squared plus 3y squared and study what, what primes appear in those quadratic forms, right? Um, and it turns out that the structure of z adjoin square root of minus 2 or z adjoin the square root of minus 3 is useful. That's what the next chapter is about. That's what the next thing we're going to do is. It turns out that x squared plus 2 squared is a prime x squared plus 2y squared, or a prime x squared plus 3y squared, a prime, um, only when p is of the form 8n plus 1 or 8n plus 3 in the case for the 2, 
or in the case of the prime is the, the form 3n plus 1 for the other one. So basically those are the there's the analogs of the two square theorem for those other other forms and so the proof basically involves an adapt adaptation of Lagrange's lemma and ultimately it's based on these um, other ahem, oops where am I these guys so like minus 2 is congruent to a square mod p when when p is like one of these kind of primes and minus 3 is congruent to some square mod p if the prime has that form so these you know we 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 had minus 1 was congruent to a square mod p where p is equal to 4n plus 1 that was the thing chapter 6 basically you know that was the big deal and apparently you can prove something similar for these other um, cases x squared plus 2y squared and x squared plus 3y squared but then greedier still there's something called quadratic reciprocity which will generate all of these different uh, characters these these quadratic characters in one file sweeping technique I, I look forward to looking at that I think we'll do that after break but um, anyway that's all I have for today folks I will try to talk more about the beginning of chapter 7 in my remaining bit of lecture I hope this format was okay. If not, my apologies. Thanks.